Terry Stratton, Director of Education and Outreach here at the Guild. So on behalf of the Guild, I say happy holidays to everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, please turn off your cell phones, your pagers, your watch alarms, anything that's going to make noise, please. We are live streaming this evening, so if you could keep it down to a dull roar, that would be fantastic. Save all of your questions for the end. We will have a dedicated question and answer session at the end of the event. Um, and when you ask your questions, if you could please stand up and speak clearly so the people over at live stream can hear them. They may have the exact same question and we want to make sure they can hear it. All right, without further ado, I want to thank the fantastic Michael John Matisa, of whom I am the biggest fan. playing a little bit of their wonderful stuff for Michael John. He will be critiquing it. That's for Michael John, so keep your critiques to yourself, though I'm sure you love to hear them afterwards, okay? Let's enjoy everybody. Hi, everybody. It's so great to be here tonight. Thank you so much, for Terry, for having me here. I'm really excited about seeing all you guys here. Wonderful to see the fellows. I'm happy about this. It's going to be fun tonight to hear some of your new material. Some of these are, are some of my NYU students uh, who are at the Tisch uh, uh, program here. I'm very excited about hearing um, what they've been working on. I'm very excited about that. I'm assuming a lot of us are songwriters here or involved in the theater playwrights, yes? So, I mean, to talk about songwriting in the theater, I mean, it's kind of, uh, I feel like I'm like, you know, you probably know more about it than I do in a lot of respects, you know? Um, when people ask me, I'm sure you get the same question, which comes first when people say, do you, do you like the lyrics or do you like the music first? And I always say, well, I always need something to base the song on when I write. And if I'm writing my own libretto, generally I'll write like um, a, a great portion of it. And I just, it's in it goes. I'll write like a major passage of a scene, once I find the project. Um, I'll write a major passage, um, you know, a lot of words, a lot of dialogue, write, write like a monologue, a soliloquy, giant scenes, and then when I feel like I've had enough material and I feel like I can find um, uh, a pulse beat in, 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 a, in a particular scene, and I know which is the, the point where the, where the characters are going to start singing, I'll go to the piano. And then it starts turning into lyric, and then it starts turning into melody. So it all begins with, I believe, the libretto. And I don't know how we do it without a good libretto. And that's one of the things that um, I've been just, you know, working on all my life is to try to develop, you know, when I write on my own, to write my own libretto, or if I'm working with another librettist, to help them, you know, because I believe that it's also the composer and the lyricist's responsibility to turn that play or that subject matter or that topic into the libretto as well as it. You can't leave it all up to the librettist to do that. And that's one of the things that makes um, songwriting for me so much fun because I can help them. I can pick and choose what it is that I want to turn into a song and not have the librettist determine that for me necessarily. I mean, I've worked with collaborators, very, very good playwrights too, um, who don't quite get the essence of what it is that we do as composers or songwriters when we look at a piece of material that we want to musicalize. And they, they very often um, will turn in a, 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 a work, um, a, a long scene or you know, characters, and then at the end of the whole beautiful scene, beautifully wrought, beautiful, beautiful words, at the end of the scene it goes in brackets, song. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, I always go, well, well go. no, I'm going to take your beautiful words, I'm going to take the best material, I'm going to take the heartbeat, I'm going to take the, 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 the skeleton, you know, the, 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 the gore, I'm going to turn that into the song. Mm -hmm. You know, I did actually did do this to one time to a collaborator. I did write him back, and I just wrote on a piece of music paper, song. <laughs> no music, nothing, whatever. So uh, it's hard to sometimes. So a lot of playwrights, you know, when they, they want to write musicals, they sometimes don't understand that the very, very best work is what's going to be the thing that's going to be the basis for our song. Now, for myself, uh, everybody has a different process. Like, we all have different process. Sees when we when we go into a song. I'd be so curious to know what yours are. Maybe we can talk about that afterwards, because I don't think any one person is the same when it comes to a time to, you know, turn something into a musical. Everybody has a different take and different process to do that. Um, for me, I always feel it comes from a character, and when it comes time for me to say, okay, this is where I want that song to happen, I have to put myself in that character's place. And it starts with, I started off as a drummer, a percussionist, not a piano player. And 
maybe that's why I always go for the heartbeat of the scene. And if I can define what the heartbeat is in the scene, if the character is happy, it's here. If it's panicked, it's here. If it's in love, it's, you know, <laughs> that. And I feel like that, that sort of helps define where I want to go musically with the piece. So I always, often, very often start with, a, with what that rhythm of that scene is going to be for me. And then, of course, all the other things fill in. If I have a melody in my head that I've, you know, that's been bothering me all night in my dreams, mm -hmm. I will write that down. It might be a piece of crap, but you know, you have to write it down any old way. Maybe that develops into something else and leads you to someplace new. So it always starts with the character for me. A lot of my songs are very, very much rooted in character. Um, there are songs that, um, I mean, a lot of songwriters will write songs that are like, that in one number that can be taken and, and moved out of the show or whatever. But I, I find it more, far more interesting to keep it really locked into the, the character and what that situation that the character may be in. Because that to me is action. And I don't know if a lot of my stuff can be lifted from shows without the context of it all, but it's not something that I actually, as a goal, was ever particularly interested in. I mean, everybody, I think we all have had our opportunities where we went, you know, walking down the New York street and we go, do I go left or do I go right here right now, you know? And I chose this, you know, that way to go as opposed to going left, which would have made me a lot of money now. <laughs> <laughs> really, seriously, I love writing the, the, the pop tunes and stuff. But very early on, I said, no, I wasn't going to do that. There was something about the theater to me that int intrigued me more, made me live happier. Even though now I, you know, I live as poor as possible, you know, on and off, barely keeping that roof over my head and feeding myself, although you can tell it from, I just, I just opened Giants, so I'm fat, or really like fat. So, you got that on the camera, right? So, um, the thing is that I, the theater for me, maybe it's also too because I'm a good Catholic boy, that the mass was always the most theatrical thing I've ever experienced, still is, you know, one of the most theatrical things to go and, and, uh, and visit. And I feel like the theater is that ritual. And I feel like through the song, we're, 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 we're consecrating something. We're, we're reenacting something, uh, some, some sort of cathartic thing. And it is through song that that happens. When I um, was teaching in, in Korea just recently, a lot of uh, songwriters are very interested in writing in Korea now, the theater, very intrigued by it all. And but their, their influences are all quite European. Very few of them know very little of Rajasthan and Hammerstein material, or even Sondheim is very not relatively known over there. And their basis of information, what they learn from songs, is, is um, sort of the European uh, take on things, maybe the Frank Wildhorn stuff. And a lot of those songs, for me, and again, it's all subjective. Some of you may love the stuff. Some of it, you know, some of it may agree with me. Some of those songs stay in one place. There's no A to B to Z development in the character. And I find it very difficult for actors to do that kind of stuff. And I'm always writing something that's going to challenge that actor to take me through a cathartic experience for that character. And it's very tricky when I was teaching that there in Korea to explain to some of the artists that were performing these songs that there's no development in this. There's absolutely no journey that the character is going on in here. So therefore, myself as an audience member, I'm listening to you sing sing really well and you're singing very powerful notes and the melody has a nice hook, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do in that. I mean, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to feel at the end of it all, except to give you praise, you know? And I don't know if that's theater for me. And I want to feel something, and, I, and, I, and that's what I strive in my songs uh, to, in, in the theater that I do, to try to have that, that effect happen to me. If I don't have it, then I know I've done something wrong with it all. Uh, and so that's sort of like the fast, that was a fascinating, uh, you know, little tangent there going to Korea and learning more about writing musicals than I ever thought I would learn about writing them. Um, obviously, when we teach at NYU at the, 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 the uh, or the BMI workshop, how many of you have done BMI workshop here? So you know how, that's, oh, you survived. You're still surviving it. Gosh, I, I made it through. Three years of that, and I said, "Oh, this is hurting." You know. But um, all those programs are really great because they also do break it down into structure, and I think that that is so fundamental to all of us who write songs. That, um, and I tell my first-year students at, at NYU, um, I, I really find it okay to, when you're starting out to write songs, to go to the classics. 
um, it's okay to emulate Gershwin's lyrics. It's okay to emulate Cole Porter's lyrics. It's okay to emulate that. You want to imitate them, but it's good to emulate them because there's structure. Once you learn those classic structures, you can take that structure out to its lengths that every wherever you want it to go. And that to me is, is something that's very, very, very important. The hardest thing for me to write is, is a, you know the, the 32 bar song. I mean, that's hard. I don't know what's in 32 bars anymore. Um, uh, these days, but those are those are tricky, and you realize the genius behind the Tin Pan Alley writers. And once you grasp that um, and sort of hold it your own and make it your own, and filter it through yourself, you um, there's more, there are many more paths are open to you as a songwriter. So I always say go back to the classics. I myself do it all the time too. My mom used to collect sheet music. You know, we go to the yard sales and buy the sheet music, buy the boxes and stuff, and then I'd have to play them for her and her sisters while they sang through every song. <laughs> um, I mean, this would start like at 6 o'clock in the evening, and then it'd be like 2 o'clock, and these Italian ladies wailing at the top of the lawn, just fabulous. But, I, but through the process of doing that, I also learned a wealth of information about songs from the turn of the century, last turn of the last century, all the way through to the next turn of the century. So that was a great, great experience. And I always tell my students, please, 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 always go and, and, and explore and do your research that way too. Because um, it, it just offers you such a, um, a, a valuable tool when you sit down and say your show is set in the 40s and you want that flavor, that soup song of, um, of the 40s. Well, what song would you pick for that? You know, and, and to know that and have that at your fingertips and available to you is really, really healthy because you can live in that. That, that place there, that, that world, as well as long as you filter it through your own sensibilities. Um, I think that's the hardest part about it for me is um, when it comes time to sit down and do and write musicals, because it takes so long to write them. You know, um, it, you know, people think, oh, oh, get this done, and then like <laughs> 10 years later, <laughs> You know, you get your show happening, Giants happening downtown. And we started that, gosh, I think in 2007 it was. Um, of course, the time writing it is like, if you were to condense it, it would come down to about two months. Mm -hmm. You know, really. But the length of time that it takes to get a show up and all the mechanics involved with it all and all that stuff that goes on with it all, it could be well into five years. So you want to make sure for yourself that, at least for myself, um, when I go into my music room and sit at that piano, I want to go back to that world. I want to make sure that I go back to that that place where the music is going to transport me back to wherever this show is taking place in. If I'm setting it in, you know, Siam, I want to make sure that I want to go back to that place. And that's the hardest thing. And you always know. I always I always know when I don't have it. And I go, oh, I've got to throw that one out. That's not engaging me. That's not transporting me to the new place. And that to me is very very important for people. Um, I mean, we have to do some things sometimes, I think, for professional reasons to make our monies and, and do that. I write for Wonder Pets. I love that series. It's really, really a lot of fun. Um, but it's not something I, you know, I, I it's like, I, I try to do the worst job I can for that, you know, um, <laughs> just to get fired. I mean, they won't fire me. Then. <laughs> because of television, I find that the, the worse I do, the worse I write, you know, the more they keep me on. So don't be just, you know, like, but um, I'm only joking. Um, uh, the thing is that you, to, to make sure that I'm in that world, and because you're going to have to live in that world for so long in that process, you have to want to go back to that world every morning and live in there. It's very, 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 very um, tricky thing to do. Um, how many are you um, involved in collaborations here? Oh, and you're still alive too. <laughs> I wish that uh, there's no way to teach collaboration except to do it, you know, because it's that's what it's all about. And um, people say, so that song is so beautiful. Thank you. Oh my God, I love that song so much. You know, you write a really good song. I go, I think just I, it's not just me. This comes from like the source material. This comes from like my book writer. This comes from the director's ideas. The saying that's too friggin' long. It. You know, all those things, they, they, they feed into that, that, that kind of collaboration. I think that's the healthiest thing. And it is also to the most dangerous thing. It's very difficult. Uh, myself, sometimes I work alone. I do write my own book and my own lyrics and my own music. But it's primarily for expediency sake. You know, because I've worked with so many slow book writers that I just want to scream about it. Um, and because it's not that I want to work fast, just that I want to get the job done. 
Um, but it is very, very lonely, and I don't recommend it to, to people to do that. I think you should go home, and it's like the, um, the civil complex. <laughs> you, know, you go home and you start arguing with your, yes, yes, the composer's yelling at the, the you know, the lyricist and the lyricist is screaming, and, and the book writer's giving everybody the silent treatment. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and meanwhile, your cat's looking at you like, okay, leaving <laughs> or leaving, you know. <laughs> so it's very, very lonely to do that without a collaborator. I always cherish it, but it is a very tricky negotiation. I'm right? Am I not right about the, the fun things in collaboration? You know, people said, what are the do's and don'ts of collaboration? And, uh, and how that makes a poor, better song. I think that that is the thing that you... you in your first draft, I, I always say to my collaborators, whatever, you know, give me whatever. There is no judgment call in this all. I respect the, the very fact that you can set pen to paper. And I think it all begins there, because if you can have respect for your collaborator, you're going to have respect for yourself. And it makes it a stronger, um, uh, a stronger, a way of dealing with things. I mean, and because you're going to really need that strength somewhere down the line. You want your, your, your collaborator to respect you too when you turn in a, a song that just doesn't quite make it. And, uh, you know, and as opposed to, you know, as opposed to saying to the, you know, your collaborator, oh man, I can't work with this at all, you have to offer the suggestions as to how to make it work better if your collaborator's willing to listen to it all. So it's a joint thing. I just hold hands and jump off the, the deep end of the pool as I did a Sybil right now. Sybil Pearson wrote my book for the Giant downtown right now playing down there. And she did a magnificent job with that thing, of translating that, you know, home into you know this 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 show downtown there. And it took a lot of work but we but we worked very, very closely together and had great mutual respect for each other and um, and I had to kick her a lot to get the work done. She's you know she she uh, you know and she knows that I had to do it because um she's uh, we're all procrastinators I think to a certain extent and uh, um, but she really delivered the goods and, and gave me moments of the most beautiful things that I could musicalize as, as a songwriter. Um, it was a really, really great thing to do that um, uh, in that collaboration. So if you can find that collaborator that you really feel that you mutual respect with, that's giving you the material that's going to make you sing um, and write beautiful lyrics, hang on to that collaborator for dear life, okay? Hang on to that person because that's something that should be really treasured and will make your own work better in the long and short of it. Um, I don't, I don't know, what do you want to talk about basics of things? I just, uh, I don't know, if they, you all seem to know the basics of, of, of it all. Um, I, I, but maybe I should ask this during the q and I'm just so curious about the, the rhyming thing. <laughs> you know, I've, I've had a big debate with my students at NYU about rhyming, because they, you know, some of them still want to rhyme rain and gain, and, or, you know, gain and, you know, sane. You know, and I'm going, ah, but I think we've broken, but, but they keep saying that's been broken down now. You know, we're all done with that. I'm thinking, I don't think so. Because <laughs> I just don't think so. Because if you don't love wordplay, if you're not in love with the wordplay as a lyricist, I don't know why, first of all, you would be a lyricist. You just love it. <laughs> and, then, and then I don't know why, why you would not, if you don't love puzzles and solving mysteries, why you would be doing that because that's essentially what it's all about. Now composers were we have to be mathematicians. There's a lot of lot of math. We don't have to know any law, but uh, we do have to know our math when we're composers. Here's just a different thing. It's, it's like solving that jigsaw puzzle or doing that uh, anagram or just, just just doing all that stuff. And I don't know how you don't want to find out or, or realize that solution. And I keep saying you know how things fall on the ear is part of the joy of, of, of songwriting. So that's my biggest, that I'll share with you, that's one of my, my big things when I teach at NYU is to talk to the students and say, you know, it's, it's okay to, um, you know, express yourself the way you need to express yourself. But on the other hand, there's something about craft and due diligence about that that makes you a better person, I think, uh, that, you, that you've gone an extra yard to craft the right sound. You know, to tickle my ear, to make my myself delight. Uh, you know, to paraphrase the Yip Harburg, old Yip Harburg thing there, that the song is that three-dimensional entity. It's a, it combines the the, the 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 brain, which is the lyric, 
and the heart, which is the music. And by combining these two things, we have the, the three-dimensional idea, of, 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 an idea in three-dimensional form. And all ideas are about the brain and contain the brain and the heart. And uh, I, I just think if you, there's a diligence about trying to be, I don't know, you don't have to be perfect with it, but you do have to know what the rights and the wrongs are about that, that thing. Because craftspersonship, I think, is just so important, and we can't lose that. And I see an awful lot of that happening with a lot of songs, and I, uh, songs that I hear on Broadway, or off Broadway even, um, even young composers coming up and I go, oh, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> why did you do that? Now I'm unhappy. You know, you know, I always tell my students, you can have a Michael John out there in that audience in the dark, scowling at you. Yes. So keep in mind, I'm gonna, well, I'll come into your dreams like Freddy Krueger and rip your brain out or something like that. So, you know, it's like, but the diligence is really important. I, and um, you have to have the soul with it, too, uh, as well. And um, so it can't be all about rhyme. There has to be reason for all of that. But um, that was just an issue that came up the other day in the lab. And I thought it was very, very fascinating that people kind of, my students kind of went, but why? Joni Mitchell does it. She doesn't rhyme. And like, but she's not writing for the theater where you hear it one time. You know, this is, there's no lyric sheet in front of them. There's no something to scroll down. You can't open up the album and follow along the lyrics in here. We're hearing the thing for the fair the first time, and possibly the last time if the show sucks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, know, um, this is, you, know you want your song to land, and the best way you can want to do it is to try to find that lyric that's going to make sure it tickles the ear and lands. And in the same token, I was telling the composers to pay attention to that. What notes are you choosing? What harmonies are you choosing? How is your scansion? Um, it was very fascinating teaching. I'm going to go back to Korea and my, and my fascination. I've taught over there a lot in Korea, and it's a very fascinating uh, journey for me to be over there and, uh, and enjoy. And I've enjoyed it so much um, because in Korean language, it's very interesting um, that uh, Korean. And correct me if I'm wrong, my Korean colleagues here, that if um, that a lot of the information in the sentence is all in the front, and all the ex the less the less important words are at the end of a sentence. So if you were to you know, write a song, how would you, in Korean, how would you make that information that's so important? In, our, in English, we generally we mix and match, and we do, and for, particularly for lyrics here, we, 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 we zap our, if we want to point up something, we, we point it at the end of the line. Ba -ba 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 you know, and we rhyme that. Ba -ba -ba -ba, you know, but in Korean, it's ba -da 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 -da. <laughs> And it was fascinating because when I get my, when I have my Korean students at the NYU, very often scansion is always just that thing that's going, well, they speak it well. They speak English very, very well. Um, they obviously understand. So why is that scansion thing? It's, some, it's something that, it's fascinating. I think it has to do with, you know, some, uh, that their own native language has that, that, that rhythm. It's not romance language. So that's been a fascinating thing too. But I also get mad at my English speaking American students who start sounding like they are from Korea <laughs> with their scansion. Because without scansion, you know, you just have an you know intel uh, unintelligible song uh, going on there. And again, it's just like that first time. I always try to make sure that uh, um, in my own shows that it's you hear it once and if you get it, great. Um, and it, you know, and, and the singer has to make sure they're very much aware of it too. Um, some of the dilemmas that I deal with now in the theater are, of course, um, sound, you know, because everybody's mic'd now. Um, when I was starting off, we, we just had invented body mics. That's how old I am, you know, it's just, you know. Um, and uh, they, they didn't have the little things, you know, you know, they had like, you know, microphones that were, you know, stand right here, <laughs> you know. So now I have to deal with sound because also too now I've got a new collaborator involved with my words and then with my music. And that's that little guy in the back there in the dark doing that thing <laughs> that things there. You know? And it's like, oh, you're actually controlling what my audience is hearing. I have no more control over that. Whoa, what do I do as a songwriter now? How do I make that happen? How do I inform that mixing guy that, you know, that's supposed to be heard there? You know, that's not supposed to be buried in something else there, you know. So it's, been, it's a, that's, a, that's a new learning curve for me, is to you know, train the, the mixer guy. It's not necessarily the sound designer. Sound designers are wonderful. There's a lot of great sound designers out there, but it's that little guy that they hire to do that thing there that's actually <laughs> dictating how your songs are going to be heard every night. And 
that's a little trick. And also do what your orchestra is going to be doing, if you have an orchestra, um, you know, how to make sure that the stuff could be sung over that orchestra. And that, that includes working with a good orchestrator that understands the basics of, you know, um, pretend there isn't any microphone. It's orchestrated accordingly, which is what I prefer to work with. You know, I work with either Starabin, Michael Starabin, or Bruce Coffin, or, or even Tunick, uh, Jonathan Tunick. You know, they understand, okay, pretend there isn't sound, this is what it would sound like. And I like that, because then I go, oh, Michael John, you just buried that. that. That's going way low in the tessitura. You've got this big musical thing there. You can't have that note there. You've got to pop that one out. And that's when I learn the most, is when that, that element comes in. But um, it's been fascinating working downtown in Giant because that space down there is a little tricky. I wasn't sure if I could do this because I had a full orchestra on stage in the back there. And I wasn't sure, oh my god, I'm going to lose some of these lyrics. What's going to happen here? But I'd be very, very pleased with the results. But only because you have to work, again, in tandem with that collaborator. That's kind of a new element to, um, to, to the way that we do theater. So I don't know, the life of the songwriter, I don't know. I mean, you know. The, I, I mean, I, maybe I should have gone down the, the left street as opposed to going down the right street. But I really love the right street. Mm -hmm. I, I love living in this theater uh, world. Um, I love writing the songs for theater. I feel like they. Um, I feel like being in the theater is where it, it's at. Um, I've never lost that uh, um, feeling. And maybe it was because I had a fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Hammer. When I was in fourth grade, I wrote a little musical for um, uh, my class, and then she said to me, Mrs. Hammer, said to me, she said, um, you should write musicals when you grow up. And you never doubted the woman, okay? <laughs> <laughs> too scary, too scary, <laughs> Mrs. Hammer, you know. And, but I did, and I said, okay, I'll do that. And I just thought that that's what you did. And, uh, and I think we all should write musicals when we grow up. So, you know, I encourage everybody to do that. So maybe during the Q&A, I can ask you some questions, and, and you can ask me some questions about the life of you know, what it means to what we do. And, um, but what I'm really curious about is hearing some songs. Can we do that today? Let's dive in. Let's hear some tunes there. Introduce yourselves to everybody. Sure. And do you want a lyric sheet? Um, you know what might be helpful to me if you have one. Oh, God, yeah, get that. See, I always recommend that. So. Hi everyone, I'm Joel Wagoner. Uh, I'm Laurie Minette. Uh, we're going to do a song from our show, Dead Woman Crossing. It is based on a true life ghost story set in Georgia in 1905. Uh, school teacher Katie wins a rare divorce from her jealous husband Martin and turns up beheaded the next day. The main suspect in the, in the case was a prostitute named Fanny that her husband was involved with. In this particular song, it takes place near the end of Act One. Our jealous husband, Martin, um, has become more and more suspicious of, of Katie's erratic behavior. So he's become convinced that she's cheating on him. Um, we envision this number taking place a little bit out of time and space. So we're seeing kind of a tableau of Katie, maybe in her real life and also in his mind's eye, doing things that she's not really doing. So it's, it's a bit filmic in that way. And we're both fellows from this year. Last year, actually. Last year. Oh, We're done now. We're done. We just finished. Oh, I love the glasses. Uh, I'm old now. So Jay's looking. <laughs> so, so where are you going now?
else you want to add to any of this at all? Not unless you have any questions. <laughs> okay. Well, first and foremost, where, 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 in the, where in the story does it take place in this musical? Where is he yeah, physically? We, not physically, but where in terms of the, the... Yeah, it's towards the end of Act 1. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so my question would be this. Um, what is it that he's going to be doing now? Um, well, he's, we wanted him to come to the decision within this song that he's going to kill her. Not himself, but he's going to come up with a plan to get rid of her forever. Okay. Because I'm not clear on that. Mm -hmm. The music didn't suggest to me, although it's twisty and it's, you know, got its, you know, creepy quality to it all. Um, you know, I got that this, it's complex and it's dark and, and there's many, many, you know, angles to it all um, musically. Um, and strange little so you're telling me something but I didn't know the specifics of of that all because uh, he does see just says this um, that's it I'll show you and then he goes back into the song and the key doesn't change at all so I'm not sure I was asking about that. yeah I, I, I go back into the same plane of music on there. So I don't know what's changed in him in terms of like, again, that journey mm -hmm. that I spoke of. So um, that would be one thing I think I, I would love for you to take a look at. You know, what is that thing? You could, um, if your song, I think we overstay some of our welcome in some places. Because I'm wondering what's happening on the stage when he's going no, no, no over and over and over again. I'm going, okay, you know, it's that watch looking time. You know, I get it, I get it, I get it. So it gets into that maybe performance level thing, and maybe that's cool. I get that. Um, but you could do something kind of really interesting. Um, because what's very interesting information-wise is, and I don't know if my baby's mine. Is that new information for us in the show? Yes. Oh, well. You know, you, you could do something very clever here if you wanted to. Uh, where he goes back into the, the, the chorus. Women, where are you going now? Every night you leave with a lady in town. Women, why you got to go? Sneak into his house. Yeah, as if I didn't know. How can you go there now? And I didn't know my baby's mine. Right? There might be some where you, instead of oh, going to that, absolutely. and then you might have some more power when you do return to it at the end of the song. Yeah, or more. You might want to think about that. That might be one way of just kind of kind of doing that little nip. We expect it to go to that place. Our ear expects it to go too back into that, where you know, no, no, no. But you don't. And then it then then my ear will go and then my you know, I'll start you know, going, oh I'll go on the story because now you're telling me something new. Mm -hmm. New information, new information, new information, new information. Always keeps me active, always keeps the, the generator running, always keeps me on a path. The minute that you start, uh, if you're on that path and you start dawdling around, no, 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 no. It's like, you know, okay, yes, okay, go. Get, get to something important here, you know? And this is a, this seems to be a very big important moment. This song, this song for this character. Right? To me, it sounds like it is. And so, so keep that energy going with it all. And you might want to play something. And maybe if you do do some edit in the middle of here, get to that important information. You might discover for yourself as the composer well, if there is a modulation. But you know that you have so many inner modulations through the whole thing. You may not need it. I think it's a texture thing. I think. It could be. Maybe. It could be textural um, with but it I all. I definitely was going to ask you. I think but it whatever your textures are, whatever your harmonies are, whatever your rhythms are, you have to know, as always, what you're trying to tell me, the audience, about what he's going to do. Um, sometimes you we you can go a cappella, and it can be even more scary. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes texture and harmonies and rhythms tell me too much, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, it's like the rock opera syndrome. It's like, yeah. okay, yeah, great, 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 great rhythm. Great four chords. You know, are you going to do anything differently to tell me something new? Great. You know, so you might want to think about that with it all. Uh, so I have, I have a question you know. back to what you were saying about him making this decision, which is not clear in the lyric. And it's not clear, no. Would you suggest, um, a, you know, an additional lyric, a new section or something like that? Or could it be solved with blocking? Is there, like, a better way? You mean, what does he do? He goes and he goes to the, the cabinet and pulls out the gun? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, kind of you thing. could do that. Oh, my God, yeah, but... Uh, 
But if your director it, says, I'm going to have him do a somersault, help. <laughs> so you know, you think it's preferable to put the decision right there in the words? Um, I don't know about that. Um, I think that there's got to be something better than that's it, I'll show you. Right. There's got to be some cle more clever way of doing that. I think you want to. Oh, my God. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Are you tired of me or a little of both? Broke my heart and your oath. That's it. I'll show you. And then whatever happens after that beat can be, you know, let me let me fill in the blanks. You know, let me do some work as an audience member. You know, you can say, and now I'm going to give it a go. No. You could do that, but I don't well, think that's, it's... That's the thing. Is, yeah. I, you don't have to do that kind of stuff. That's literal and that's, you know, that's telling. Yeah. You know, they don't want to tell anything. No. You know what I mean? You want a show. It's a show. Not to tell. Thank you, Jerry Robbins. You know, uh, you know. So I think that you can avoid doing that absolutely. And you could do it with stage directions too, obviously. But it's more or less about what he feels about what that that moment is. And once you define, I mean, what is it that I'm? I'll show you. I'll sh show you. I'll do something to you. Is what he's saying. And um, it's going to end here. Um, so you have to like sort of find what that is musically speaking, yeah. and you have to find that in some of your play. Lori, 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 Lori. <laughs> you rhyme sometimes, then you don't rhyme sometimes. Why do you do that? <laughs> well, um, would it make you feel better if I fixed some of the rhymes just for you? <laughs> you can do anything you want. Again, it's your choice as the lyricist, but the only thing, and I, I, the only note that I would have is like, it's consistency tells me something um, about it. If, in other words, if you do rhyme, and you rhyme correctly, I think this is an interesting rhyme here. Are you tired or mean or a little of both? You broke my heart and your oath. That's a fine rhyme, and it's an unusual rhyme. I'm, you know, my ear goes, oh, interesting. I've never heard both an oath. I, I can't remember when I've heard that. So that's very clever. But then home and stone, it's just like, oh, you know, it just makes me depressed. <laughs> How do you feel about the now in town? Because um, I thought that's what you were gonna. I I don't know. I, yeah, it's a big issue with me. I mean, what is it? Uh, the Bronx is up and the batteries down. The people ride in a hole in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got me on now. Those uh, those rhymes there. You know what I mean? If it was good enough for Betty and Adolf and then. <laughs> Can I say? Of course, they do. Like they do write ground in the lyric. It's G R O U N apostrophe. So you know what I mean. They made a choice. You don't do that. No. You know. Well, the thing is that the thing that you would want to be careful of is if you were to hear it in the theater and on stage, whether or not we would we would know that you're seeing the Lady of the Tao. T A T A O. Would your singer make sure that they were singing that end? You know what I mean? These things go into play when you're not properly doing that stuff or, or paying attention to that stuff. Because you set me up to hear rhyme. You set me up in the first beat there. You have these inner rhymes in here, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, baby crying motherless. I can't tell her. I can't begin to guess. Another good rhyme. She rhymed. Perfect, right? But then I'm thinking, oh, maybe that was a mistake on the singer's part that they rhymed town with now. Mm. You know, this whole, that whole thing goes in through my head. Of course, I'm the stupidest theater goer on the planet. <laughs> I am. You know, I'm the dumbest audience member you will ever meet. I just, I am, I'm dumb. I don't know what it is. I'm, you know, I think of, I think of myself as a pretty smart guy, but I'm dumb when I go to the theater, and I just go, what do they mean by that? You know, I really am, I'm dumb. So, you know, watch for the dummies like me in the dark. <coughs> you know, so it just depends on what the, what the uh, setup of punch is. Be consistent, and then I think that then a lot of things fall into place. Would be advice. But it's a very, uh, very intriguing uh, little beat there. Very macabre. Where is it set in again? 1905. In Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. I, I got the southern feel in it all. I got the, 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 the darkness of it all. I got the, um, the, what is that called? The, the, the moss, Spanish moth, moss. Yeah. Or in your lyrics, Spanish mall. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm actually going to make that a lyric now. I know you will. <laughs> but otherwise, very, very good. I'm very oh. pleased. I wish you the best of luck on this song. How many songs have you written for it all? For this show? Ten-ish? Good. We sort of did a whole good. 
retumble, so we're not all sure that all of them are still going to be in it when we're finished. Well, of course, yes, it's called rewriting. Right. So yeah, let's kill yeah, the babies. We've got, yeah. we got a 10, to, 10 to 12 songs. Good. Congratulations. Keep going on and on. I think there's something really quite beautiful in here, so really nice. Very good work. Thank you. We'd like to do something next. Bill. Hello, Bill. Bill and Anna. Go ahead and introduce yourselves to everybody. Hi, I'm Bill Nelson. This is Anna Kate Jacobs. We wrote a show called Harmony, Kansas. And we picked, we're doing a song that's near the end of the show, so I'm going to give you a little more, a little more background information than normal. See, just take my coat off. What do you mean? Oh, it's another screen. I'm just going to call it. I'm yes. very sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. Sir. Harmony, Kansas is about a guy named Heath who's a very conservative gay farmer in a rural community where it pays to blend in. And he's obsessed with earning respect by fulfilling his perfect image of what a farmer is supposed to be. Meanwhile, there's this group of uh, rural gay guys in the community who get together once a week to sing. And his partner, Julian, who's from the city and much more open than Heath, uh, he bargains him to, into joining the group, and he ends up discovering a love for making music and a kinship that he didn't expect from the, uh, with these homosexuals. But when the group considers performing in public, it rocks his world, and it threatens everything that matters to him, his idea of the life he's supposed to be living, and he's so thrown out of whack that he ends up telling Julian he should move out and return to the city, which he does. And we'll talk about the song. Okay, so this is uh, a song for Heath, and it's the penultimate song of the whole show. Um, and we picked the most challenging song for us to write in the whole Good. show. It was a, the show was um, premiered in San Diego in the spring, and this was the one number that we still miss with our heads after we saw it night after night. So uh, in this number, uh, the other guys in the group just told Heath that they're going to go ahead and sing in the festival whether or not he chooses to do it with him. And so he said he won't. Um, and he has essentially separated himself from them. Uh, and we wanted to make it clear in this song that he's struggling with that decision that he's just made. And that somewhere deep inside he wants to be performing with them. But we don't want to reveal too much because the turn where he does decide to perform has to happen for, in our opinion, at the end of the show. Yes. So we're struggling with that. Okay. <laughs> and there's a there's a running thing where the a group of voices sing the song about the land of Kansas. That it's is, the men in the chorus, but they also they they sing as an ensemble. Right, kind of out of the narrative, but it's, and they recur. And so at this point, they're going to show up. So when we're singing, all three of us, I'm not Keith anymore. I'm, and then I go back to being Kate. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, so, uh, when you were explaining the song, Anna, the, you mentioned uh, uh, the the it messed your, your heads. What was what, what was that experience? <laughs> well, you um, heard this live in the theater. It was was it orchestrated or <laughs> was it? Ultimately, it was done with a piano and a double bass. Okay, good. So it was orchestrated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what was challenging for us was that um, we were expecting the subtext to read clearer than it was. Uh -huh. And so the moment where he turns at the end, we have to do a lot of really, really heavy rewriting the book around it to make it feel set up because we felt like the song wasn't doing, this song wasn't doing all of the work. Oh. But we also, I mean, the other thing that we struggled with was we wanted to remain true to this character of this man who really is not all that self-aware and we don't feel like he's still reached the point in the show where he's able to come out and say what he really wants. And we wanted to save the actual turn for Finn deciding to join the guys in the next scene and the final scene where he does join. Okay. Well, you know, always, you know, when you're, the penultimate number of stuff is always difficult. Those are very tricky beats, penultimate beats. Um, but do keep in mind, you know, if, you, if you've if you experienced something with that particular number, it may not be the number in and of itself that you may have had the dilemma with or that was the, the problem child. It could have been the beat before. You know what I mean? How did you set this number up is as important if not more important than the number itself. So did you analyze what happened before? You have to do that, because if you because you have to do that, because that may be the thing. People have this misunderstanding that musicals are all about the songs, that we, you know, they're really about the transitions. Musical, musicals are all about what goes between the songs. How you get from song to song is what's gonna give your songs their import, their, their landing, their, their ability to move your audience, the ability for your audience to go along with the story. You know, without those transitions and those beats that lead into the song and analyzed and looked at and really discovering this is the beat, your songs can suffer an awful lot because of it. And it just takes that, uh, it could be a one matter of one line that can suddenly change the entire import of the song and suddenly you've gone from this to that, you know? You never know. Um, in the song itself, though, I, I was curious about something in, in the lyric here. Um, the ensemble comes in singing, right? Their Kansas song, right? And then he says, "Ah oh, hell, I want to go join him, go sing the stupid ass song show." Okay. Well, what's the? Where's the surprise in all of that? There's no surprise what? if he's going to say that, right? right? To me, I mean, just hearing that, I go. Oh, he's gonna, he's gonna go and join. He wants to, you know he wants to. But I didn't hear any struggle in there, musically speaking. So I went back to this big anthem-y kind of thing, and I didn't hear enough of the, the, you know, the no, you know. There's no no in the anthem, you know. Um, uh, the fight in there, no, I can't do this. No, I can't do that. No, I won't. I won't. No, no, no. You know, it's it's a, it's an inverse of uh, don't tell me not to live. Just sit and I won't sing in your gay man's choir. You know, <laughs> no, 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 mama. <laughs> you know, don't. No, no. You know, that's and you know you look at the penultimate numbers and some of the great classic musicals. Of course, is Rose's turn, which you want to try to do. Um, here, um, you know, what I mean, that's what you. I think you're you're looking at trying to create here, possibly, because it, it has to be that that soliloquy. Um, so that's that's the dilemma for me. I mean, you say at the top of the song, um, they've got this whole thing wrong. If they cared about me, they'd listen to me and see what they were doing wrong. See what they have to lose. What is what is that in reference to? Can you? just told them that they're all they're going to be called fags and they're going to be left out of town. And okay. Okay, great, cool. Because this is all a verse here, right? Um, this is what we call a verse, this verse. Uh, I suppose I should have known, but if it, it had to go and end, why call me their friend? I haven't felt this alone since the day I told my father we'd be vaccinated and they ran away. I miss my family. Things like, I miss my family. 
Things like, oh, hell, I want to go join them and sing the stupid as it's, it, think about this. Are there ways for you to put that into the, the music of that, the yearning of that? The, is, is that something that can be unspoken? Because that, to me, is the song. It's sometimes it's the unspoken things that make the song work for me. Um, my favorite song on the planet probably is, uh, well, my most, one of my most favorite songs would be uh, um, If I Loved You. You know, which is all about I love you. You know what I mean? Just the most brilliant way of going about doing it. That just if you hear it, I, I start crying right now. You know what I mean? It's just it, to me the, that thing of the thing that's not spoken. So um, we we will know he misses his family if musically I hear it when he sings about since the day I told my father I'd be back soon. You know, then ran away. No. You know what I mean? Again, you know, just that those the struggle against what he's feeling emotionally, and what he comes to may may maybe something to explore a little bit more deeply in the song. Um, I can be nothing more. It'd be great if if the if there was something to address within the song itself. Of it, it feels generalized to me. The idea of I can be nothing more is a very general statement. And um, I could be nothing more than a man who farms, a man who loves the earth. You have these things in there, but I really need to tie that in more, because I'm not sure what it means. I could be nothing more than, I will be the man I'm supposed to be, and I can be nothing more. I like this verse here. A man whose work makes him strong, who doesn't care that the days are long, a man you can depend on, a man that make you proud, whose hands are cut and bleeding, no selfish crap allowed, gotta see this through instead of running the way I did before. I'm not sure what that means. I'm gonna take a look at that lyric there. Um, I will be the man I'm supposed to be, and I can be nothing more. I will be the man that I am and nothing more, right? Because he's describing himself as that. So there's some tenses about, some tense things and some conditional phrases that I go, I wish there was a little bit more clarity in all that and less generalization of it all. Because that's really a, a very, very, very good thing, way of making your character not be too self-aware, but totally acknowledging what he is. I'm this, my hands are cut, I work really hard, I can't do that stuff, you know. I can't be any more than that. Um, maybe what you need to do is um, also address in the penultimate song of, um, I don't know if the Kansas song, is there something that he does in the Kansas song that starts joining in on that? And then says, and gets out of that. You know, as opposed to him singing, oh hell, I want to go join him, go sing the stupid ass song. If you show him wanting to do that, and then no, no, I'm not going to do that. And I think um, his basic fear of joining them is something that you might want to explore too psychologically. What is that? I don't know the whole show, so I don't know the whole um, the whole character or anything or what you what you've set up for the character. But what is the psychology? He, he's not going to join them because he doesn't have fun with them. No, his he's scared of being called a, a, a faggot or something. Yeah, he or? feels that he needs to be. A, a Perfect farmer, and that means masculine and, and non frivolous, like very Midwestern. Uh, but the reason, this is a backstory. The deeper reason to. is that he, because he ran off from his childhood farm to go be gay, then his family ended up losing their farm and they all died, and so, like, the legacy <laughs> died with <laughs> them. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I want to hear that musically a little bit more in here or something. I think that that's your, that's your mama, mama, mama moment. You know what I mean? If you want to go that dark with the whole thing, if you, it is a drama, right? Musical drama. Is it or is it just? Or is you it know, it's like a dramatic moment in the context of a like mm -hmm. dramedy that, for the majority of the first act, is like pretty off so yeah. this is the this is the darkest moment we have in the whole show, and definitely the most dramatic. Song. It seems to me that this is a dramatic mo moment. I mean, there's just no getting around it. So that's why it's, it's a musical drama. Get over it, you know. But you have to find your tone for it all. You know what I mean? If it is campy and it is parody, and then I don't know if there's any room for moments like this because this is a dark thing. This is very very dark. 
you know, but where's where's that beat there about what he did to his family? That's what the song is about, to me, or should be about. If you want your penultimate thing, it's time for him to look directly in the mirror and go, oh my God, no, 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 you know, no, no, no. So, um, but it sounds very intriguing here. What happens at the end? He joins them and gets back with his boyfriend. They sing. <laughs> they sing the Kansas song. Do they sing the Kansas they sing song? They the, the festival, the, the, the Sunflower Festival. They all sing. Oh, that's so gay. Um, <laughs> the Kansas, the, the, this, this, this Kansas land, or the Kansas land? This Kansas land with fields of gold is our home. Room to be who we will be, this is home. Come and stand here in the open where the sun warms you through. And you'll know beauty you've never, never knew before. Okay? You know, it's like, it, and you'll know beauty you've never known before. Never knew. It's a weird, it's weird syntax going on in there, Bill. Um, you, don't, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. You, you'll ne and you'll know beauty as you've never known before. It's really what you want to say there. And this sounds real clumsy. You know what I mean? Unless that's what you want them to sound like. Like it was written by, you know, <laughs> dummies. City <laughs> <laughs> Hicks. <laughs> You know what I mean? So that's that's something. I mean. Make sure that you're clear about that. Because if it is a homemade song, you can play around with that idea. But you've got to be really, got to make sure that I know that as an audience member too. That oh, it's a homemade song. You know what I mean? So that I'm not thinking, oh, I didn't quite get that. Or is it? Because if it is a real Texas anthem or a Kansas anthem, it, it has to really follow within those guidelines of that, which is very strict uh, grammar and all that. So just be aware of that. Um, or you know, put your tizzes and stuff. Depend. When is when was the anthem written? To you, for us, or the, for you, in your mind. This anthem. When was it written? Um, it's a folk song. But when? Turn when? Of the turn of the century. Great. Oh, thirties. No, well, it's a Wait, turn of the century or 30s? <laughs> yes. Always make a decision about I those kind of things. It's a folk song that's been around for a long time, but that why... Great. Decide for yourself <laughs> when that song was written. These moments of pastiche are so important to your scores when you use them well. You know, they're, they're really, really important, but you have to know when and where they were done. You have to get in the mind of the composer that wrote that little pastiche number. You have to pretend, you have to, like, sometimes invent the entire biography of the, of the brothers that wrote this swing song. You know, you have to invent the whole biography in your head and live that. Because these pastiche moments are always great to use in a score because they, they, they add to the tapestry, they add to the bloodline, they add all these, these wonderful colors to things. But don't just write the something that sounds like it all, really go there and, and know. Filter it through yourself, which is what you did, but also know for yourself who wrote this. Who was that composer that wrote this? You know, just have all those things. Make it rich. It just it will add more color. Because I wasn't sure if it was here or there, but I kind of want to know that it is either turn of the century or something. There's no such thing as a timeless thing, per se, because you know, there's some always period flavor about things. And if it is a turn of the century song, I really want that color in there. That'd be great to have in there. So, but I'm very curious to see how many, and you've done this as a show already, right? Mm -hmm. Wow, what, and you have some good singers. And stuff. This is really high. What was it the, when you sang it, Anna? Is it, is it for tenor? Uh, no, well, I was singing up the octave. Oh. Oh, I don't mean I'm a music offender. Because I'm a lady. Oh, uh, you yeah. <laughs> 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 Right. This is like, you would hear this. Is it written for tenor? Is no, it? it's written for a baritone. It goes up to an E flat or an F. Okay. Okay. That's what I was curious about. Because some notes seem really oh, out there. Oh, I thought, I wouldn't mm. do that to a No, no, no. Not, 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 not in that range. But I was just assuming that it would be baritone thing, tenor, right? Goes to a tenor? Uh, yeah. I think we usually try to cast it like a baritone. Okay, great. 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 <laughs> okay, and you have a big chorus in it and stuff and everything? You get a big chorus? It's only a seven-man seven show. Oh, okay. Yeah. Terrific. It's not a chorus. It's like a little 
singing group. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Well, this is wonderful. This is very, very good, though. I hope it, what are you going to do next? We're working on that. Are you good. Working on that? Do you <laughs> I love that you chose the hard stuff, and that's very important. Today I'm working on a new show, and that's the first thing I went to when I got to the piano, was the hard moment. You know, got my coffee, got my pack of cigarettes, got my vodka. <laughs> it's 7 o'clock in the morning, I'm ready. <laughs> I do the hard thing first. It's always great. Do the hard thing because cause then, like, you've done the hard thing. You know, you did the hard thing. And it might suck, but it's like, you did it. No. It just gives you that, you know, gets you through the rest of the day. That's so good that you did that. I love that you did that. I mean, you feel good that you said that to me. That's Good, very good, guys. Very good. Uh, good to see you. Please introduce yourselves to the I, No, we will. We will. Hi, hello, everyone. So I'm Andrea Lepsio, and this is Kevin Ray. Kevin Ray, this Hi, is the Kevin. Kevin. Breakdown. This is the show. Kevin Ray uh, wrote music and lyrics, and uh, Kevin and I wrote the book with Sue Ellen Vance, a digital story. Um, we actually did the show in Korea, believe Love it or it. not. Love it. Oh, thank you. I we can talk. You we were there at the same time, actually. We can talk, well, we can talk subtitles. <laughs> we were in, in our hotel so yeah. that they had come there to go to your workshop. Oh, oh how wonderful. Yeah, so Where so were you guys staying? In the, in the, we were in, in Daegu. Summer. Were you in Daegu? I think so. <laughs> Uh, no, kind of by the river. Yeah. Yeah, we were yeah. Not too far from there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we were there. Anyways, so Send Let Me Breakdown tells the story of two brothers. Bill, a confident tenor sax player, finds easy success in the swing era. It's in the 40s. Um, he finds easy success in the swing era while his talented brother Jim, a bebop composer and innovative alto sax player, struggles for recognition. The evolution of jazz and the rise and fall of the Central Avenue community drive the action of the story. Um, the song comes if, uh, so at the end of Act One, Bill wins work with a big band and heads to New York. Still in L.A., Jim gets pulled into the darker side of the jazz scene. The brother's father, William, brings a cop into a drug den trying to save <coughs> Jim. Chaos erupts, fatally injuring William. This song comes early in Act Two at the funeral where devastated Jim eulogizes his father.
this is the son that's singing to the father that's just been killed, right? Are the uncle still around too? The, the bro brothers? His, 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 his brother's not home. His brother's in New York. They okay, tell so, the brother. so, okay. It's oh. the father and two brothers. So it's Father and, two brothers. and so, two brothers. Okay, great. I was just want to make sure I got the family uh, lineage on the depth there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the question, and, and this, and this is a musician. This, this guy's a, a jazz musician too, right? He's a yeah. yeah he's yeah. Not My one question here, and, and it's and it's a good song. Um, uh, Kevin, it felt it was in the country western vein. I wasn't. Sure, did you feel it, was that intentional that it was sort of like a in a, in a country lament? Uh, uh, Styling. It's not deliberately country. Yeah, I mean, it has a little bit of that blues in there, a little bit of the country, but it felt very country to me. And I thought, where's this set at? And um, where is this taking place? It's set, it takes place in Los Angeles. They are originally well, from Mississippi. Okay, I could. I, well, then maybe that makes sense to me. I just was expecting. I heard jazz. I heard bebop and I heard jazz. And I thought it, they're very no mm, really the vast majority of the shows. Yeah. Jazz. So I thought interesting. This it'd be interesting to see how this song falls into the panoply of other jazz things because it stuck out. I thought this is like a one of those like a, a very very top 40s, very recognizable. You know, instant. You know, it has good melody, strong melody. But it was in that country vein. I thought, oh, we're in. We're in the fields of Texas or Kansas or wherever we were at. In so that would be my one thing. In a bum day, be, 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 be. you know, what I mean that that sort of that's very country, and I thought it was very intriguing that you used that there. Um, you know what I really liked, Andrea? There was one thing here. In uh, these lyrics too. In these, in these. Be careful what you give me credit for. So well, what, what are you doing in it? I'm book. You're just book. Yeah. And whose orchestration? Okay, so yeah. Kevin. So <laughs> there. The yeah. lyrics here too. Where did you? How did you get the lyrics from? Where did they come from? From the book itself when you when you adapted the song and to make it into a song. Uh, from from the original concept. Of the book. So in other words, like um, when they when you got this when you got a script. Well, let me let me interject for just a second. Kevin wrote and created this originally in 2000, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and then as we he and I were working on it, we needed a more experienced book writer to come on and help us with the like the foundational scenes. And things. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. But it was originally sung through from beginning to end. Wow. Uh -huh. And uh, and the family coming from Yazoo, Mississippi, actually comes and sings this very country song called California. Yeah. Yeah. Before yeah. Deep digging into this jazz life, but the thought is a failed jazz musician, uh -huh. and the two brothers, one is sort of the voice of swing and one is the voice of Bach. Uh, yeah. This brother is kind of the voice of Bach, and he was never able, his, he, his father realized how talented he was, and it was very hard for the two mm -hmm. of them mm -hmm. because of his failings. Great. I, I, okay, good. I think I'm just asking like a real practical question about for Kevin is like, um, what did you when you when you when you first began writing the songs for it all? What did you, where did how did you come to write the lyrics from it all? Were the lyrics something that was it like from a script? You saw there was like a monologue and it said, oh, I'm gonna take that moment there and turn no, it the, into the concept. The concept the song. was was uh, the original journey the idea was was a, a Cain and Abel type story. So. Uh -huh. Legit. But practically, when you sat down to write the song, what, how did you do? Just, just well, write the I mean, lyrics first, or practically, I yeah. just I was I was I was stuck. And, and so you I, said I was just like I don't want to say anything. Yeah, I see. yeah, right. I know, right. Um, so you wrote, but but I think this is a really good moment for a song. I have to say, it's a really great, great moment for a song. No doubt in my mind. You know, this is singing over the, the, the body of your, you know, uh, someone that failed you, and now you're in fear that you're going to fail yourself. I think it's a very interesting dilemma. I think it's definitely worthy of, of a song. You know, those kind of moments are really great to find in a show. You know what I mean? That that. In other words, why is this night more special than any other night is your rule of thumb. You know, what makes this night more special? You have to boil it down to the very essence of it all when you're doing songwriting. What makes this moment more important than any other moment? So this is a good, I think, a very strong, important moment in this song. What would be really intriguing for me is if, um, now you don't have to do this, um, depending on putting on your feelings about it, but there was something interesting in the lyric where he said, um, about the wrong notes, and I thought that's really specific, and I like that. The rest of it all had a, a very generalized feeling through it all, and by the time I got to the end of the song, I kind of went, I know, I know, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. Even though there's a journey in here too of it all, but the generalization of it all, 
I, I, I would encourage you, maybe if there is a rewrite to be done, or maybe the talks with your book writers and whatever, how to put in just those, what, what were some specific things that this, that this dude remembers about his dad? Smells. When he did this, when he sang that, when he was this, you know, what he did bad, what he did good. So that can all, the, but really specific things. It's not enough to sing about. And I, uh, uh, what does he do? He goes, um, it's a shame you couldn't hear, or I never could find the right notes. I love that. But I was lost in the scene. I was eager and green. I could not understand what the lesson might mean. The one thing I knew. The, the, the really re that really rang true, the one thing that came through was that I never was good enough for you. Okay, that's the end of the first verse. It's tough now, where do you go from that? Because you just said, boom. Oh. But now we, now you want to try to, now we need to find some sort of exploration, otherwise we're gonna get ahead of the game. The audience is gonna get ahead of the game. And it's gonna be one of those moments where at the end of it all I'll go, I'll applaud you for singing this really well and for it being a really good melody and a, and a good song. But I'm not sure if I've learned anything from it all at the end. And I know you want to do that. So maybe there's some sort of specifics that you could find in that second verse that keeps me on my toes a little bit. More realizations of things, more new information. Um, I see you've cut a big section in here. Uh, what was this big section here? Uh, nothing good enough for you. To, oh, oh, and the job and your wife and your ordinary life, not the scene that you're in. So those are some specific things in there that kind of got cut. Hey, if I had another day, I'd play, another, I'd, I'd play the song another way. If I had another night, I'd get the phrasing right. I just need a little time. I really could make it shine. I could show you, Dad, that I'm the son you really want me to be. Um, I just wish there was more specific in there, some colors and stuff in there. You know what I mean? That would really make that melody stronger and more, you know. Otherwise, I'm sitting there going, going okay, stop crying, get on with it all. You know what I mean? You want to make sure that I'm staying there. I couldn't figure out your rhythm at the beginning. What is your rhythm in the, at the top of the song? What is the rhythm in the first verse? I feel like it was like you were in three, uh, almost in 12, eight. Of, of the melody or the piano? Like in the first page there, I don't want to say anything at all. Could be what was the what, what meter were you playing? Were you playing the stick four, four? four? It felt like there was like a twelve eight going on, but in, in a couple places there, um, with the triplet stuff in there, it was, kind of, it was very intriguing. Um, and I thought, oh, he switched the meter there or something a, a little bit here and there, um, and I had a hard time locking into it all. So again, when I, I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you were here, but um, you know, it's always good to sort of define what the heartbeat is of of this character in this moment and, and build on that, you know, build on that and lock into something and build on that. I think you could really gain an awful lot from it all. How much, have you done this show yet, guys? Or? We, we were at uh, the New York Musical Theater Festival in 2011. Uh -huh. We won five awards there. And then we... Oh, cool. Well, why are you coming? Why, 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 it always comes back to structure. It always comes back to structure. So we want to do whatever we can to. Well, it's hard. I mean, uh, how, how are you willing to do it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's hard. I mean, it's hard when you bring in a whole bunch of new people, and all of a sudden, you know, you've got a whole new book. And are, are you trying to work around the songs that you have? We're doing. No, we're doing both. Oh. We gener we've generated a lot of new songs, and, and oh, uh, yeah, and Kevin's been pretty pretty open if I say this ain't working. I mean, they've worked with two really strong ladies there. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is it is really difficult to uh, you know come in and you've got to hold your guns, you know, and stuff. But it's up to you, like, how responsible are you to the songs that are there that you really that everybody likes and stuff? And how do you how do you when you're moving forward and changing the book around? How do you accommodate you know a really good song? We ask, well we ask ourselves uh, specific questions, you know, mm -hmm. in the collaboration and. And we ask ourselves, is this as specific as we can be? Is this a new song or an older song? This is, this is an old, one of the yeah. oldest ones. Yeah. And um, you know, we, we talk about the fundamental reasons why to make the change. You know, we we have a ton of interest in the show, and we actually um, we what you nailed us, man. You just Michael John, you nailed us when you said the audience gets ahead of us. Yes. We have so much good music and so much good going on. And and this is one of our biggest challenges. This and length. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean already. I mean, even the song, the song is good, but you have to know when enough is enough. It's like it's making a cake. 
you know, it really is making a cake, you know. And I mean, you know, you, you keep, it says for three eggs and you put in five. Uh, not fun enough. You know what I mean? You could just start really watching, you really gotta do your measurements right. And I think it's also too, it's it's something that you may love something a great deal, you know, and, and it's important to love what it is that you've written and, and cherish it and nurture it. And, but you also have to know when when's enough enough is enough, you know, when you've got state, it's welcome. And that is really, really important for your audience because you don't want to lose them in too much beauty. Like this song this moment here, I can say this very honestly. This is a really great moment to me as well. I really like this idea, this moment here. It's, oh, funerals are so great. I love when people die and people get to sing. It's always so great. But also, too, psychologically for this character, it's a great thing. And I love the message in it. I just love the message. Now I'm not, you know, thanks, Dad, for fucking my life up. And it's you know, just it's a great song. Actually, right up against it. Uh, the whole opening of Act Two is this huge blues number. Sure, it's, it's a great idea, and, and it, it's going to be a great contrast to it all. But again, you know how long we need to stay in this moment. We may not need to leave, stay in this moment as long as you think we do. Once we get it, you know, once we get it. There was actually you know, a little piece of it that, that I played that was, has already been cut. We've been, we've been, we've been uh, we have been cutting this number. Good. You know, we yeah. constantly talk about that nothing is too precious, but at the same time, Kevin's music has gotten such recognition that we want to also honor that and, and take the best of it. It's lovely to honor one's music. It's lovely to honor one's words. It's lovely to do all that uh, honor and stuff. But the bottom line is it's your show that needs to be honored. You know, what, what the, how are you doing it for? I mean, it's only about the show, the show, the show, the show, the show. You know, I honor you and your music, but I really would love to honor the show. So you just always have to really watch those those things. You know, it's it's. I you know I have the same problems too. I'll tell you, like the giant, which I had to trim down from a, a five day event into <laughs> yeah, a two act musical. So and a lot of those babies were killed along the way, and you know, um, and people really stuck up. They said, "But Michael John, it's so beautiful. You can't cut it." And I would go. We're going home now, guys. You know what I mean? It's, we got to get this going. And so you have to be really, you have to be very much aware of that. All. And if, you're, if you've got a good heart and a good soul and a good head on your shoulders and a good ego, most importantly, a healthy ego, you know, the, you're going to know that your beautiful music is always going to be beautiful music, no matter in what form it's going to take its place in. And if you can tell the story as much as you can within the music, that's even better. Um, I feel like I got, in this song here, I feel like maybe you could have maybe, I don't even know if I need to go back into the second verse. I'm wondering if I can add two of those really healthy choruses. You know, that verse really, with the wrong note stuff, really landed for me in a really poignant way. You mean um, not go back to the, to the final verse of the bridge, or? Yeah, I'm thinking, yeah. I mean, maybe there's something in there, though. You know, how, you know sometimes when we, when, we, when we condense, we actually have more power in the condensation that we have in the sprawling event of the song. Sure. You know what I mean? Um, I, I find that an awful lot um, in a lot of Euro musicals. Um, even like Les Mis, which is a great favorite for a lot of people. Um, not for me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, because it's just, oh. Do you, find, do you find that it's a balance between condensing and, 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 and also making sure that the song actually works musically? Yes, it, it's, it's, that's, that's what I was saying about the puzzle work and the, the, the gameplay. You have to love doing that, and that's, that's the puzzle that one has to figure out all the time, going, did I just chop off my arm here by cutting this thing here? You know, oh my god, it's walking with one leg now. Oh, no, I wrecked it. You, you know that yourself as a composer. You know, but can it do without that extra tail? You know, can it do without the extra finger? You know, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe those are the things, you know, can it do without those extra pounds, you know? Those are some of the things that you have to look at when, when you look at it all. And, and you'll know it, too, in the course of the thing, you know, um, that, oh, wait, this has to be the moment, you know, give me a kiss, give me a kiss, whatever that song is. Yeah, that goes on for 10 years. And I just go, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, it's going to be okay. <laughs> He's praying. You have to watch a man pray. And it's like, you know, but, I'll, but 
I can tell you that audience goes, you know, so who am I? I'm a fool about that. You know, so that's yeah. the thing. So, yeah. but I've got 10 minutes. Okay, but thank you. Good job, guys. Good luck with it all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for being so brave and so bold and so generous with your gift and your talent. Thank you. Um, I've tell them if you want to ask anything, any questions at all. Yes, dude. Uh, What's your name? Mari. Mari, hi. Hi. Uh, you spoke about the uh, composer sometimes taking the biggest chunk of the book or the best chunk of the book and musicalizing it. How do you feel when a librettist uh, tweaks a lyric or rewrites a lyric or cuts sections out of the song to make it work? The moment. I mean, that's my job. <laughs> that's my job. It's a job. You do your job. <laughs> I'll do my job. You may make suggestions about how I could do my job better. That's all you're allowed to do. <laughs> you really. That's mm -hmm. my job. It's a job. It's not camp, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not, you know, it's, a, it's marriage, but you can't have sex. You know what I mean? That's the problem with collaboration. <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, it's marriage, but you, you just can't have the makeup sex. So, no, no. You can listen to the suggestions, and if they're good to your ear, then you can make the cuts. But that person should be going through your work and, and doing it. That's disrespectful to you, and, and don't do that. I haven't made myself clear on that. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Just a comment. I'm, I'm Peter. Hi, Peter. Uh, just a comment on the um, uh, perfect grind thing. When some sometimes people present me want to write a musical and they'll have the lyrics there and it's like chock full of. I just say, get get Stephen Sondheim's finishing the half book. In the beginning, he's got that chapter on rhyme. I said, read it, memorize it, tattoo it to yourself because it, yeah. it isn't said any better than that. Yeah. Or, well, I, I think uh, Oscar Hammerstein says it better in his book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Ari Gershwin even says it better than Ari Gershwin. Yeah. 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 So yeah, and, uh, and Steve learned everything from those guys. So, yeah. yeah. You know, but it's like, uh, but I would say yes. Take a look at those books because yeah. they will tell you in in wonderful ways. Yeah. And the joy of doing that and to find the joy in doing that it does drive one crazy, doesn't it? Home and alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 There's a time in China that was like, uh, you talked about rhyme originally. Could you tell me how you feel as a composer and an audience about uh, phrasing and, and meter? Uh, if, do you want them to be exactly the meter? The lines have to be the same? Uh, well, you know, I think it all depends, again, on the, the dramatic moment. If I'm in a happy mood and I'm singing about whenever I feel afraid, I hold my head erect, I listen to a happy tune, and no one will stay. I don't know, that's not, that feels weird. You know what I mean? The heartbeat is like, but, you know. So therefore, it's the situation of the character in the context of the moment that I would pay attention to. Now, if you have a character that's out of her mind, you know what I mean? She's walking all over the place. Halloween is a good song from a, a, Applause, which I think is actually a very, very inventive song, Charlie's transcript. And that goes all over the place in all sorts of time meters. It's like three different time meters in the ball. It's all crazy. That to me works because why? The character's kind of wounding. She's going through living, living some really thing. So that's when, you know, it all depends on, if, if, does that answer your question about the scan, uh, about meter? Phrasing is a different thing. Phrasing is a different thing. Um, I like people to honor my phrasing that I've written into my music. Generally, I don't let anybody breathe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when, uh, when you're picking um, a story or a book for a new piece, uh, what's the advantage of picking, let's say, some, something like a Shakespeare theme or something that uh, doesn't, doesn't specify like a certain time as opposed to, let's say, the story of uh, Mayor Koch uh, mm -hmm. and, or something very specific? You know? Well, nothing, nothing cannot not make a musical. I mean, you can use, you can use any you can use source material, anything that's available you can use. Um, whether it's Shakespeare or it's from uh, ripped from today's headlines, any or a movie script or a poem or you know some myth, 
Uh, any, any, and every, any topic is available to you. There's no rule that says this cannot be a musical. There's no, I don't, I, did anybody come down from the mountain with that etched in the, the granite? No. So anything, go, anything goes. Um, there are advantages to using plays, for instance, because the plays have dialogue and they're already written and may have a soliloquy in them. Shakespeare, of course, is the prototype for, I think, American musicals in a lot of respects because you have those soliloquies and you have those monologues and everything. And those are what songs are essentially are. They're the close up on us, uh, you know, on our on, on the movie Close Up uh, on us. And Shakespeare, you know, his monologues are very much the songs in, in the plays. Um, you can do something very hard. You can always like adapt a poem, but you know, it always has to revert to drama. You have to make sure that whatever you're doing is, is an attempt for drama. Um, and even if it means like taking a movie script, you know, the problem with a lot of movie adaptations that we see when they turn into Broadway shows is um, movies are done, and I was saying this earlier, to, I think uh, to, to, that, that um, you know, movie scripts are in three acts generally. And so when people say, oh, I'm going to adapt this as a movie, Beethoven, the dog movie. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be, but they don't bother taking that three act format that screenplays in and making it into a two act form. They don't know how to do that. The mechanics of it are different, so you have to know how to do that. Um, so there are you know, there are specific problems with adapting certain things like a movie, poem. You have more freedom; it can be anything, but as long as you can turn it into drama, that is where that's where it really um, you really have to find your way into and to find a good. Does that, that, that help answer your yes, question? Very much. Thank okay. you. Yes, dear. Um, so you talked about the 32 bar structure. Yes, what um, is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how do you know when to break out of that? Because I, I think I, I was very much brought up in that, and so I struggle with breaking out of that. And how do you know when to or why or how? Again, it all comes from character. It all depends on the moment, what the character's feeling. If if everything's been said that needs to be said, then you know it's 18 bars. You know, if it's you know, if I've written songs that are six bars. They're not really songs, but they're you know, you know, whatever they are. It's, it's done. That beat is done. It depends on what that beat is for you and how to define it. I don't know if measures are as important to you as they are to this composer or, or, or myself. I don't know what measures mean to you. And struggle, I don't know what struggle is. It's just, you know what I mean? What is that to you? Are, you? are you stuck in a mindset of, I must obey the pop songwriting rules, or I must obey the imaginary rules of you know, musical theater from the 40s and 50s if I'm going to be successful. If you're going to do, if you're going to struggle against that, you know, then, then you're, I, mean, I don't know, if you're, not, you're never going to free yourself from it all. So I'd say go and write as many 32 bar songs as you want and put them all together and make it into a 148 bar song. You know what I mean? So it's, it depends on what it is that you want to say, that the, the character wants to say, when that character has said enough about whatever he or she's saying, and whether or not musically you, you formed a, a feeling of of, of uh, getting into that character's soul and leaving me with an impression that I know something more about the character and about myself. A couple Hi. more here. Okay. I'll do one more. Good. Good. Nice. Hi, my name's Ed. Hi, Ed. Hi. Let's say I have the germ of an idea. I'm a librettist, lyricist. I'm working with a composer. Now I have the germ, and I'm working on a treatment, and then I'm going to be working on the libretto. To what extent, and, and depending on what circumstances, would you involve the composer like in the treatment and in going forward in the libretto itself? Well, I, I'd wait till I felt it was time. It's always a very nerve-wracking thing when it's time to turn over work. You know what I mean? You always get nervous. You go, mm, you know, if the composer's chomping on the bed, give me material, give me material, take a look at your contract. If it's a commercial contract, then you have like, you're supposed to deliver it on a certain date or something. But if it's not, you know, you, to, you have to say, I'm not ready, quite ready for to share this part yet. Or if you really love your composer or your collaborators, you go, oh my God, it really is the inspiration here. Take a look at this. Tell me what you think about this. Then it's, then it's time. You don't have to do the whole thing. You can do it in sections. Uh, I would say whatever you need to do, though, you have to dive in and do it. 
you know, there is no right or wrong, and you have to, and you have to know that uh, you yourself are strong enough to, to take whatever criticism is going to come your way um, and be ready for that. Uh, you know, but I don't think you're going to get that if you and your collaborator have forged a good, respectful relationship with each other, but it's not judgmental. And that's the time when you can turn over your work to a collaborator or a composer. Or if you're looking for a composer, um, I would have enough material uh, from what you have to finish the whole thing. There's nothing scarier to a composer you know, than when someone comes in with the box. I've written my new music. Can you trust me setting it to music? Uh, we're, 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 well, 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 we can work on that together, maybe? You know, it's like, you know, it's some, there's something scary about that. So, I wanna, you know, you don't necessarily even have to finish the whole thing. Do some, uh, what you think is really representative, what you love. You, like the kid did over here. They went to the hardest song that they decided to do, the hardest part in the <coughs> germ of your idea, but you think, go to that one, write that one out. Finesse it, make it great. And you never know, maybe another scene will spring out of your, you know, out of the head, you know, for it. And, and come up with a bunch of that material. And then, then you'll be ready to you know, give it to your collaborator or, or, or you know, find a composer would be interesting. I think I don't have to be I'm very sorry.